So we're just coming to the uh, last day of our <clears throat> collective meditation practice. So, of course, practice continues. How does it continue? All these different forms and changes. Continuation is about the only thing that continues is wisdom, or can continue is wisdom. <laughs> Sensations, feelings, energies, moods change, impermanent. Only thing that can continue is wisdom. Now, wisdom sounds kind of theoretical, or what's a, what's a wisdom anyway? Mm-hmm. It's this uh, uh, expressed in a range of ways, but. Uh, Mm. teaching on dependent arising or idapacheta conditional codependence is uh, um, again it sounds sounds very complicated but it really means that uh, nothing ever exists except in relationship you know things co-arise anything that happens any sensation, any feeling, any thought any person so whether it's gross and obvious or subtle and refined, nothing stands alone. Everything that manifests, manifests because of co-arising. It's dependent upon other factors. So relational clarity. Mm. Relational clarity means we begin to uh, look towards a certain sense of balance in what we're doing. And fundamentally, it's the relational clarity of, of wisdom, dependent arising, is a, you know, it combats and it, it deals with clinging. And the psychology of clinging is always one where we separate. You know, I hold on to that. I hold on to that. You know, things have to be held on to. Or I, re- I lean on, I require that. I'm resting on that, so we cling to that. You know, or we cling internally, I am this, I'm clinging to my opinion, my position, and the rest of it doesn't count. Hmm. So it's uh, clinging to systems, clinging to techniques, so I can get more firm and solid. Yeah. Uh, and we're looking to clinging to provide us with uh, uh, solidity, stability, which is a very important uh, concern for people, humans, to feel secure, safe. Mm. As we get very anxious and, and vulnerable, we're aware of that. So we want to cl- clinging will provide us with solidity, security. Clinging will provide us with um, continuity, that is, Keep with this. This is going to last. Keep with this. Hold on to this. This is going to take. This is going to stay there. Cling to this state. It's going to stay. Cling to this place. It's going to be good. Cling to this person. They're always going to be this way. Yeah. Continuity. The guarantee. The future. Mm. And a sense of flowing along. Mm. And clinging will provide us with fulfilment. That is, if we hold on, we'll be filled with what we hold on to. Mm. Mm. What we hold on to will give us a constant feeling of fulfillment, fullness. And so this is kind of what the average person, untrained mind, or our mind in its untrained states, when it, and it loses wisdom, when it loses clarity, tends to go to those things. Mm. Get, hold on to this, create this, make this, stabilize this, I will be stable, secure, that's fine. I'll be fulfilled, I'll be filled with that thing. And uh, it all rotates around essentially solidifying and continuing and fulfilling me. You know, and this isn't a thought, it's, it's an instinct. It's the untrained instinct. And, you know, 
that instinct seems that seems about it. Yeah, yeah, I want to be fulfilled. I want to keep going, and uh, yeah, I want to feel okay. And why not? What's wrong with that? Uh, but of course, you know, then you come to these kind of miserable Buddhists who say all oh, things are impermanent. We're all going to die. Everything's beloved and pleasing. We separated from me. <laughs> <laughs> and you can they got a point. <laughs> it's all unsatisfactory. I mean you got they got a point, but you know, why rub it in? Because <laughs> from the untrained mind of view point of view, these kind of reflections and recollections just sound kind of miserable. <laughs> but actually they are uh, as you develop and cultivate, those are actually the things that turn, flip the mind over, out of clinging, into freedom. And freedom doesn't mean irresponsibility, freedom really means clarity. The mind isn't confused. Um, Serenity. Mind is peaceful, equanimous, mm. and presence, you know, sense of collectedness, presence. Mm. And the presence is not resting on something, the presence is the presence of, of clarity. Mm. And the point is, of course, that what the miserable Buddhists, you know, are actually saying, you know, is that the clinging is a kind of stopgap, short-term measurement that doesn't actually work because, yeah, you know, we can't live forever. We Things can't be continuous. We're not impervious. We are impinged upon. We're not solid. Yeah. We're not actually secure. You know, so you, you realize just how just a human body, you know. You know, that's kind of what you need to do to stay halfway comfortable with it, wrapping up in clothes, huddling into buildings, running around umbrellas. <laughs> you take it all for granted as as norm, but you know, when the power goes or the you know, suddenly, oh, if I didn't have all those supports, you know, lined up, things would be really very uncomfortable. So then actually when you start to really see things truly as they are, they are insecure, they're not continual, and you get grateful, and you get contented, and you start to uh, not indulge, and not be dismissive, and not dominate, you realize we're in a sharing context here, we're all dependently arising, codependent, dependent upon people, things, the earth, our mind states, our behaviours, are all mixing together into the present moment. And it's the thing from the planet earth to the quality of attention from the most coarse to the most refined. They're all coming together at this particular time. Be clear. And none of it can be really be neglected. And in that there's no room for a separate self. So we get clear about that. There's no room for a separate self on any level. Out of no, no separate self out of existence. It's not like I can dismiss conditioned existence and live in some kind of cerebral hyperspace, isn't it? I can't come and live in Nibbana somewhere <laughs> and do all this. Nibbana just means not clinging. Mm. So these three signs are uh, impermanence or change, dukkha, unsatisfactoriness, anatta, not self, which are First of all, it's slightly disappointing and then somewhat mystifying. How come there's no self? Where did it go? Mm -hmm. 
Uh, they're actually they're, they're kind of codes or they're, they're cryptic memos that help us to recognize where clinging occurs because it is so instinctive and so in, intuitive, you know. So it's when you start to take things, when you start to become an I am something, the, hey, what's happening? When I start to feel I am something or a position of some kind or he's that way or she's always like that or they never will, what's happening? What's happening? You know, it's like the alarm bell goes off, clinging, <laughs> check it out, what's really happening? You know, frustration, conceit, uh, dismissiveness or indulgence or something like that. Uh-huh. That's the that's the condition arising. That's the condition that's dominating any particular time. So with condition arising, you don't have to know everything that's arising. You don't have to know fundamentally the lead feature of it, the lead, uh, the dominating condition that's dom- that's generating the clinging. You know, these are ethical. Uh, and they're directly experienceable. We begin to experience thoroughly in meditation the movement of indulgence, the movement of dismissiveness, the energy of uh, grasping, the manipulative, the lazy, hmm? you know, where clinging, you know, the opinionatedness. Hmm? And, and recognizing that for the the, the mind in its untrained states, all those experiences are valid and seem to be paths to happiness and truth. <laughs> you know, they seem to be, my opinion always seems to be, right now, it's true. Otherwise I wouldn't be holding it, would I? You know, if I didn't think it was true, I wouldn't have an opinion. But I do think it's true, that's why it's there. Yeah. on an instinctive level so you, wait a minute it's only sort of partially has some truth in it and you can kind of recognize the quality of, of clinging so these three characteristics hmm Permanence. Now, from the un, the untrained mind, thinks well, impermanence just means well, you know, we die or that uh, things break up. You know, you buy something and five years later it's 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 wrecked, it's ruined, or you know, your clothes wear out, or you know, it's kind of very like there are definite things that change, things that go through change. They're born, they go through change, and they die. You know, fundamentally. But actually, in meditation, you see that that rather sad truth is not quite true. It's not impermanent enough. You take it very thoroughly, and you recognize nothing fundamentally exists at all. You know, there's an arising, and it immediately translates into a feeling, and a perception, and a mental formation, and, you know, where's the thing? It's like a a play. You experience a a sensation. What sensation? What's actually happening? You experience a feeling, a perception, an impression, a reaction coming together. There isn't a thing. There's an interplay of factors. When you say you contemplate (coughs) breathing, you know, you look into breathing. You know, you try and find where the breath is. And what you find is energies, sensations, feeling, perceptions. There's no breath, there's no breathing. That's a separate thing. Mm-hmm. Even if you become very one-pointed, your breathing becomes something like a kind of a, a, a perception of light, flowing, changing, shifting, subtly shifting. Even your attention is very still. 
So impermanence doesn't just mean that there's a thing that ends. It means nothing really fundamentally, no solid, separate thing exists in the first place. So it's just gestures. It's just uh, appearance. Hmm? Check it out when you taste something. Hmm? When you get to direct experience. Taste something. Salt, sugar. What happens? There's some kind of contact impression. A little flurry. Very subtle recognition, labeling, salt. And then whatever we feel about, whatever happens about that. I remember, and it's, I remember particularly with taste, I had, a, you know, I had a jar of vitamin C powder. I thought I'd have a spoonful of vitamin C powder in the morning ward off colds and flu, so I put a teaspoon of this vitamin C powder in my mouth. There's this moment when, jing, <laughs> salt. <laughs> vitamin C on the bottle doesn't mean there's vitamin C inside it. It just means the bottle's got vitamin C written on it. <laughs> Interesting moment when you kind of, something wrong, something wrong. <laughs> you know, you can't, because you're so convinced this white powder is vitamin C and you put a spoonful in your mouth and there's this kind of <laughs> this kind of spoonful of salt it's quite strong of my mind kind of <laughs> what, <laughs> trying to find a perception of what's going wrong what's going wrong feeling perceptions where was the salt you know when I looked at it there, it, there was the vitamin C it was there I had a spoonful of vitamin C the label said vitamin C spoonful of vitamin C in my, in my spoon once they got into my mouth, where was the vitamin C? <laughs> you know, you realise that these are all just labels, aren't they? Something in the spoon is called vitamin C, whatever vitamin C means, just a couple of words. Yeah. There's a visual experience, that's vitamin C. Taste experience, that's salt. Concepts, labels, perceptions, feelings, reactions, responses. What's there? Yeah. Just that, isn't it, really? So impermanence means really the relative existence. Things have a relative appearance. You know? And often these are extremely uh, affect. Uh, themselves are very affected what's beautiful what's necessary what's important I don't know so we often deal or manage uh, our lives through generalizations and concepts such as Friday um, building Chittaviveka um, Bhikkhu something and, and these kind of hold up, relatively speaking. But when you look into them, you can't find it. You just find constant co-arising of factors that, you know. So whenever things seem to be continuing, continuing, you know, so continuity is the uh, attitude or the impression or the notion that clinging sets up. We will continue. This will continue. There will be another breath. This was in the past. It will be in the future, at least for another second. And radical Nietzsche says, no. (laughs) No, it doesn't. What does continue Wisdom continues. Clarity continues. That can continue. Anything that we see as an object has no continuity. We create a continuity by giving a label, such as bhikkhu suchito. 
you know, will continue for probably a few more days, years, who knows. You know, Chitta Viveka, oh, salt. Hmm? Give it a label, that will make it continue. Put the spoon of vitamin C in your mouth, where did the label go? So what this helps us to do is to, you know, recognize the relativity of labels so we're not stuck on them. We're not trying to make a thing, Bhikkhu Sujitta or Chitta's Monastery, into a permanent continuing thing that I can love, lean on, be averse to, have opinions about, whatever. We see that as an, uh, something a relational experience. What's it doing to my mind? What am I hoping for? What am I dreading? What am I? What's being? What's it bringing up? Is it bringing up skillful factors or not? Can we use it to bring up skillful factors? Freedom from fear, freedom from aversion, freedom from craving, freedom from indulgence, freedom from clinging. Mm -hmm. Using relative experiences, appearances, not because we believe in those appearances, but because we can find our balance with those appearances. If there's no such appearance as Chitta's monastery, you know, then where do you what do you use? Hmm? What do you relate to? There's no such thing as, you know, bhikkhu sangha or nuns or rojana. What, what do you what do you relate to? What do you get your relational clarity around? <laughs> you know. So we have a very strong sense of continuity in terms of precepts and um, renunciation and you know these things. Because they help to, they give us some way of keep relating to this. You know, it's the opposer today. There's no such thing as an opposer today. Because there's no such thing as an opposer today, that relative appearance of opposer today is, is something we relate to rather than cling to. <laughs> you relate to it, okay, bring up the energy. So you, rather than it should be this way, it should be that way, you know, I don't want it to be like that. Because there's no such thing as a breath or breathing that you can hold on to. That there's the appearance of breathing, therefore you relate to it. You don't judge yourself in terms of it, you don't cling to it, or you notice the clinging to it, and you start to get a sense of really listening, feeling, sensing, using it as a reference point to notice one's dullness, or one's harshness, or one's pushiness, or one's controlling, or whatever, and begin to release those. If we didn't have something to refer to, an appearance to refer to, we couldn't purify our relationships. And relational purity is the thing. <laughs> if you want a thing, relational clarity is the thing. Being with other people. We live sangha means community. And yet there's no community. And we all know it's continually breaking up and changing and shifting. It's a constant kaleidoscope of people moving through. There's no community. Because there's no community, we relate to it as a community. Not as something to cling to, but okay, let's make space for so and so. Oh, let's, you know, this, that, and the other. Let's work together. Uh, let's try and understand that. Let's support this, you know. We use it for relationship. Cling to it, it's always, oh, why are all these. It'd be great if, community would be great if there weren't people in it. <laughs> Uh, all these people with odd behaviours. <laughs> I like to have a community with no people in it. <laughs> it's 
So, you know, letting go of the grasping, the wanting, perfection, stillness and tranquility and comfortable and easy and, you know, not having to tolerate or support or be supported. I like to be independent, not supported, you know. Don't fuss around me, that kind of thing. You know, let go. Let it be, you know. A sign of uh, unsatisfactoriness really means when you contemplate it as a, in terms of insight, it's nothing fills you. You know, what clinging and craving are telling, telling a mind, have hypnotized the mind into, is crave and cling, and what you cling to will fill you up, and you'll feel fulfilled. And it doesn't happen. Oh, well, you clung to the wrong thing. Try one of these. That will do it. Oh, that didn't work either. Well, you need another one. Oh, okay. There's something wrong with you. <laughs> you should be happy with this. There's something wrong. You, must be, you must be wrongly adjusted. You're neurotic. Yeah. What you need is one of these. Oh. I think, oh, oh, well, maybe I'm happy then. I guess so, because it says so on the label. <laughs> this will make you happy. Oh, this is what happiness is, is it? It's kind of slightly frustrated, worrying feeling of getting a little bit of something and wanting more. That's happiness. <laughs> That's it, yeah, go and buy another one. 10% off. Free offer. Wow. 10% off. 10% off? I must get one of those. Where's the 10% off going to go? You know? Why don't you have 100% off and not get it at all? <laughs> <laughs> no, no, that's no fun. You know, I need to be filled by something. But they didn't quite do it. So try something else. Still not fulfilled? You're just miserable. Cheer up. <laughs> so, sign of dukkha is a sense no, nothing wrong with you. Nothing wrong with you. You don't get filled up by this. Nothing, you're totally straight. Nothing wrong with you at all. You don't get filled by any of this. Oh. What you get filled by is wisdom. It's the only thing that fills you. <laughs> the only thing that fills you. You don't get filled by anything else but by wisdom, fulfilled wisdom. Hmm. That's great because you don't have to buy it. Get it. Just to use it, to use it. And the thing that, uh, as we can recognize, what dukkha, unsatisfaction is masked by, is that movement. They didn't work, oh, try this. They didn't work, go there. They didn't work, you know, there's always some action, some shift that has to happen. Don't stay with that feeling of dissatisfaction. Shift to the next thing. You haven't got a next thing, look for a next thing. Mm. Movement. Movement masks the real truth of it. You, know, you stay with the unsatisfactory, you know, feel the energy in your mind kind of reaching and then beginning to dwindle before it rushes off to something else, staying, staying, staying. Let the energy change, don't create a mood out of it. You find your mind kind of it's calm and emptied. The emotional momentum that craving and clinging sets up, the energetic and emotional momentum that it sets up, definitely rises, pushes through, gets desperate, urgent, needed. 
just stay with that. Coming into body presence. You know, let the images. If only I had one of. Hmm. I've only really got to. Uh, whimpering. <laughs> Why can't I have? It's my right. Uh, it's not fair. Mm, fading. And you feel a sense of, uh, you know, how the, as that movement moves through, the energy is definitely involved with that movement towards fulfillment, satisfactoriness. You're staying with it. It opens into something quite marvellous. Stillness. uh, mm. Depth. Presence of clarity. And all the emotional ricochets and reactions are understood for what they are. That's natural. That's the momentum. That's the power of the wave. We all have that. Our minds do that. There's nothing wrong as such. It's just natural, you know, static. The complaining, the wanting, the needing, the justifications. My mind does that. Well, I just need a little bit. Yes. Uh, and relating to it steady not dismissing it rejecting it believing it (laughs) relating to it open, clear, warm letting it move through you're all right you're all right there's nothing going wrong you know things arise and things pass but you've got to recognize that before they can pass, they have to arise. The arising is sometimes rather giddy, out of control experience. Hmm? The arising of one's emotional momentum, the arising of the power of craving and clinging. And when it doesn't get what it wants, it gets very wobbly and thrashes around a bit. Mm. And arise, let it arise. Open, open to that. Create space around that. It's just something needing to move through. And you just, you're coming back to the body, breathing, walking, you know, simple reference points to relate to not to suppress, just to relate to, to hold the space where that wave of dukkha can move through. And then you know, you, you are Phil. Just you didn't have quite the right sensitivity to appreciate it. The hindrances the way we're geared, mind is geared to fairly, you know, fully, strongly felt impressions, not to something as subtle as clarity. So meditation, so important to train the mind to be receptive to the nothing much, to sitting still, to not getting anywhere, to being ordinary rather than looking for the strongly felt feelings and blazing impressions and great ideas. Mm. Then you really you know, that clarity is not an object. It's not something that you can have. It's something that you practice. And solidity, anatta, 
you know. So, you know, not self is dismissed, overlooked through solidity, abiding. And yet, as you begin to contemplate and recognize anything that seems to be abiding, that we seem to be itself, is not that way. For a start, you never abide in the same place more than once. You know, it's a sight, a sound, a thought, sensation. Be clear about it. We abide generally. We use a generalization like I'm living in this monastery or I live in a body or I live in my mind. But when you get down to specifics, what body? You know, look at specifically what arises. Sensations, impressions, appearances. It goes from visual to tactile to conceptual to the future to the past to, you know, conceptual things like I live in this monastery to, um, you know, abiding in happiness or abiding in well-being, you know, subtler states. Yeah, there's no real abiding. Solidity, if something's to be solid, it would have to have boundaries, wouldn't it? You'd have to have an edge to it, like a rock. You'd definitely say there it is and there it isn't. This is a solid and it ends at this place. Anything solid has to have an edge to it, right? There's no edge to it. It can't be solid. It would be, be gas, wouldn't it? Or air. <laughs> so solid things always got boundaries. You try and find the boundary of your mind. Hmm? The boundary of your sense of self. The boundary of your awareness. Because it's so preoccupied with the center what it's focusing on, you know, particular object that's interesting me, so we focus on the center, you don't notice there's no boundary to it. You go to the boundary of your body, that impression of a boundary is not the edge of your awareness. You, that sensation arises within awareness, not at the edge of it. Anything you bring your attention to becomes the center, not a boundary, Right? As soon as you attend to it, that attention pulls it into the center of your awareness. Right? Hmm. So if I go to the sensations that I call the edge of my body, they become the center point. Right? And we recognize as a kind of feeling awareness around that sensation. Hmm. Go to the ending of a thought, you know, a thought form. You know, there's a space around that. A feeling, sensing awareness around a thought. Boundaries keep shifting because as soon as you notice one, it becomes a center point. Boundaries of a day. Visual boundaries. You're walking up and down your path, and you think, yeah, I'm living in this particular place, and my vision is this way. Go to the edge of it to look at the boundary, and that boundary will immediately become the center of your focus. And you can never get to the edge of your vision, because as soon as you get to the edge of it, whatever's at the edge becomes the center of your vision. (laughs) You keep turning the edge to 360 degrees, you never get to the edge of your visual field, because whatever you see becomes the center point. So the boundaries keep being drawn in. You can't find a boundary. If there's no boundary, how can anything be solid? And if you have no boundary, you know, you imagine you've got a boundary. What is it? (laughs) Can you locate yourself in time? Can you say you didn't exist yesterday and now you exist today? You can imagine a time when you didn't exist, but you can never know it, because as soon as you existed, you can't know that you didn't exist. (laughs) 
So you can never feel the moment of, a, of your self arising because you, as soon as you notice that, then you're aware of it arising. You, you, your mind is bigger than its arising. And that's kind of what we do. You know, and you contemplate, you notice these self forms arise, but they arise within awareness rather than at the edge of it. So I am is a continual fluid arising, hmm? not solid, it arises within awareness. And it's the clinging that starts to make that I am a fixed point. And then the energy goes into solidifying it. I'm going to be good at this, I'm going to get one of those, I'm going to make sure this never happens, I'm going to, you know, solidify, solidify, so it become more and more solid. But if you recognize the kind of energy that goes into that, and the stress that goes into that, and still it doesn't quite work, because I keep forgetting something, or losing it, or not being able to do, or not quite being as solid as I should be, not turning up on time, not being impeccable, not being, dang it, I'll try even harder to get that I am really nice and solid. It doesn't get solid because it's it's not its nature. It's a movement. An energy movement that pulls a huge amount of energy and attention and attitudes and emotions and concerns to it. It's a dependently arising grasp that draws a huge amount of energy and forms to it and a huge amount of suffering to it as well. Now, if there is no boundary, then we're beginning to instead of, again, relational clarity. I have to recognize that this awareness can, is continually being permeated, supported, activated in a dependently arising way. Where do I find solidity? I find solidity in being clear, in being void of harshness, void of indulgence, void of doubt, void of wavering. I find solidity in void. The clarity that allows void, voiding. Not avoid, just clearing out. And this is a whole paradox, isn't it? To become really solid, you want to become empty. If you want to be really continual, be momentary. If you want to be really satisfied, give up trying to satisfy yourself. And that's the paradox, isn't it? It's completely nonsensical in words, but as a meditation, you've got to almost enter that paradox transmute this power of clinging into the power of liberation because if one is living with relational clarity if there is a living in relational clarity this itself must be void of abuse of defensiveness of fear of loss of grief this must be for my welfare, for the welfare of others, and for the realization of Nibbana. You know, so we're practicing with that. You know, maybe this is conceptually dense, but you know, when you come down to just breathing in and out, and you realize you just got to cultivate and let it teach you let that appearance purify so you become more attentive less much more in the moment not trying to build something up not using it to block thoughts but not being caught in thoughts either what is there to be listened to what needs to be investigated as you're breathing in and out what particular mental concerns is it time to address? 
Mm. How do you relate? How do you use that appearance as something to clarify your wisdom, your clarity as to what's happening now, what's arising now, what thoughts are just to be let go of, what thoughts are something we give attention to and breathe through, open up, what's the meaning of this, what's the edge of this, what's the friction in this, can I breathe into that, can I start to open that up, look into the feeling with that, look into what's accompanying that, or what are just things you're saying, oh, just put that down, it's just irrelevant now, stay with this. This is, requires wisdom. Wisdom in terms of breathing is what is the right kind of attention to sustain. Mm -hmm. And over the fullness of the flow of breathing, the flow of those appearances, how do we come out of meditation? Is there something you come out from? Or is, can you sustain the quality of mindfulness, attentiveness, restraint, so forth? You really retain what's important, what is to be continued is wise practice. You know, just drop. You're very attentive in meditation then, oh, we're having a non-meditative bit, you know, being attentive, oh, then go back to the meditation being attentive again. <laughs> You know, it's not an on-off practice, really. If it's on and off, then realization is a very patchy affair. So contemplate. And if something is useful and what's been said, just pick up that. Look at boundaries. Look at sense of self. Look at relationships what things do we find ourselves recoiling from, you know, edgy about, embarrassed by, uh, wanting to hold on to, contemplate, contemplate. Mm. This isn't to humiliate, but to free the mind, because in that, in those energies, there's something there that just needs to be turned around, turned around, so one's, Anxiety turns into responsibility and compassion. Yeah. One's rigidity turns into a sense of strength. Mm. One's indulgence becomes, turns into something kind and compassionate mm. through non-clinging. There's a transmutation that's possible. Otherwise his life would not be geared to the highest happiness the highest welfare. 